Good afternoon. My name is Adam McDaniel, the lead operating system architect for a Linux distribution called Jolly Cloud. Of course, the distribution tailored towards netbooks. The topic of my presentation is Git, the source code management tool that you could use for building, developing, maintaining, supporting any type of text-based source code. We currently use Git at Jolly Cloud for managing all of our individual packages. So since Jolly Cloud is a Debian-based distribution, we import all of the source code from other different packages like Bazaar, uh, Subversion, CVS, or whatever, bring it into our local Git repos where we apply our changes, we repackage them up and distribute them along our app repository. That's, in a nutshell, my job. What I'd like to do for you is describe how we use Git within Jolly Cloud and to give you a general primer on how to set it up, how to interact with it, and some of the core features of switching your project to use it. If by chance you happen to be having a netbook that was running Linux sometime in 2008, you also might remember me from the Array.org netbook kernel repository. This was a huge project that I did. This is where I found out about the whole Jolly Cloud thing. They actually contacted me through this and it was all in response because Ubuntu had challenges producing proper drivers for netbooks. So I made a little app repository, made my own kernel. Well, that's the legacy of how I originally started learning about Git. You've got online and offline capabilities. Once you do an initial online clone of your repository, whatever you're talking about, all the other transactions you can do can be completely offline. So if you're stuck on a plane for a 10 hour transatlantic, you could still do your normal job on your computer with complete offline access. Do your commits, rebase, merge, diff, log, whatever, and it will actually remember the timestamps as you do it. And when you next get internet access, you just push it up to the server and the server, it's like you're never gone. Another unique feature of Git is the staging area. The staging area allows you to validate and sanitize what you're looking to commit. For those of you who are familiar with CVS and Subversion, you probably know that once you commit, it's like it's written in stone. The staging area is sort of like a, a level in between your working copy and your commit, so you can actually validate what's actually there. Am I happy with this commit? Is the commit accurate according to what I'm trying to represent in my log file, etc., etc., etc.? Another cool thing about Git is that it offers the most correct form of branching and tagging. Again, if you're familiar with Subversion or CVS, you know, it takes a week to plan for a branch and emerge in CVS and a whole day to implement. With Git, it's a matter of minutes. Subversion's idea of tagging, it's basically a branch. What's the point there? It's incomplete. It's not correct. And Git addresses both of these shortcomings. Git also offers a really cool graphical history browser, which I'll demonstrate for you here. So you can actually visually see how your project has progressed over time, how the other people have contributed to it, and actually see flows of your code or your project over time. And uh, the example, of course, I'll bring up is the actual kernel itself. Uh, we can see all different development paths that other people have taken uh, to get to the point where we are today. Finally, of course, we've got multiple workflow options. Um, in that depending upon your project, you might have a specific access control structure or you might have a specific way as to how you want patches to be sent to you. Git offers very, various methods as to how you can deploy it so that you can accept patches in a way that you're happy with. Whereas Subversion is just one way, CVS is just one way, Git offers many different options. So, what exactly makes a truly distributed source code management tool? You can clone the entire repository from the actual remote source. You have a copy of everything. So when you clone, say the kernel for example, you get the entire content in one fell swoop. You can navigate to and from based upon tags here and there, but you get everything. Let's say you're interested in another branch or another older release. You don't need to re-download it again because you already have it. And Git's main goal, design goal in terms of its architecture is to store that information efficiently on your local working copy, your local working clone of the repository. When you actually perform changes, you push the local changes to a server and you pull remote changes in. Once you've actually committed everything, it's not actually on the server yet. You do need to push it up. And likewise, when other people do the same, you need to pull their changes into your local working copy. You can commit, tag, branch, merge, everything without needing any network connectivity whatsoever and still have a complete representation of what the actual project looks like. Finally, you can actually selectively push and pull from multiple repositories at once. Again, using the kernel as an example, I have done uh, several different junk branches that I really don't want anyone in the kernel to actually see. This is my my working area. I can take that information, clean it all up, produce it in one main branch, and that's what I upload to the actual kernel projects. And likewise, vice versa. I don't care about the uh, ARM ports. I don't care about the rel time patches. I don't care about any of this. I only want the Intel drivers or whatever. I can selectively pull that in. The staging area allows you to isolate individual changes from your working copy into the actual commits. So let's say you've been working for days on one specific 
feature in your project. And you've got 10 different files that you've modified, but theoretically it should actually equate to five different commits. This staging area allows you to selectively pick the individual files and say files one, two, and three become commit one, which is this message. Files two through or four, five, six become another commit, which is this message, 79, and so forth. The staging area allows you to logically group changes according to commits based upon your entire work and copy modifications. Another cool thing about the staging area, it actually allows you to amend previous commits. Again, something you can't do inside of Subversion or CVS. It's basically written in stone. If you forgot something from your commit, your last commit, go back and change it. It's perfectly cool. You know, you can add files back in, or if you realize that, hey, this file shouldn't have been committed under this change log, you can take it out, put it in another one. It's completely flexible in that regard. You can even produce a commit, push it to the server, realize, oh, shoot, I forgot something, and actually force a revision update for that individual commit and push that over top of what was actually sent up. Whenever anyone new is looking at your project, they don't even see what was there, they just see the latest commit that is exactly how you like it. Git also allows you to stash incomplete changes away. So if you're in the middle of a particular feature and your boss calls you up and says, hey, customer found a bug in this program, you can stash your current changes away, revert to a clean working copy, perform your fix, and then retrieve from that stash the original content. You're creating a temporary branch that exists sort of like a limbo. You're just stashing it away off the side. Finally, of course, the staging area allows you the opportunity to validate and resolve any merge conflicts. You know, merging, you know, if it doesn't apply cleanly, you'll have to apply the conflicts or whatever. But the really cool thing about the staging area, it keeps track of what merged successfully, warns you about what failed, and so you only need to concentrate on the failures rather than having to dig around for a ridge or reject or accept files or whatnot. So the stashing, does that require any network connectivity? Nope. So everything's local. CVS can tag, but it keeps track of the files on an individual basis. It's not the state of the entire project. Likewise, CVS can branch, but adds two digits, two major numbers to an individual file number, you know, it seems very incomplete. Good luck if you ever want to actually merge something because you need to know especially where you forked, where to put it in, uh, you know, where your change start and ended. It's a real manual process. You can make it work, but it's a pain in the ass. Subversion can branch fairly well. Unfortunately, tags are effectively nothing more than branches. It defeats the whole purpose. There's no real differentiation to say that this is a tag, this is a branch. Subversion's way of working around that problem is to literally create a directory structure of tags, branches, and trunk. It seems half-assed. Subversion merges do work, at least the first one does. If you actually try another one, you end up with the exact same problem you had under CVS. And finally, of course, the branch history. Anything you actually did that was merged, in essence, it's all flat now anyway. You can't go back and see a commit or a revision a week ago came from another branch. It was just like it was always there. Git's tags are applied to the individual commits. Git's commits, they're just like a, a roll of film. One picture, one picture, one picture, one picture. When you tag something, it's at that exact state. It's all the files uh, that have changed, all the changes up to that point of that one state. Sure, you can move the tags around, but you can't just simply change a file and push the tag around. For lack of a better term, tags act like tags. Branches, of course, can also be used in order to branch your commits into an individual topic. And then likewise, when you merge them back in, Git is smart enough to recognize where they forked, so you just need to run a git merge branch name. Make another change, run git merge branch name. Make another change, git merge branch name. It's all completely automatic because Git knows where it started and what it's missing. Even if you had manually copied over change from one branch, say the master branch, into your topic branch and continued working a topic branch, when you merge it back, Git would be smart enough to recognize, hey, you've got this code here that already exists in master. There's no point in putting it back. There's no point in conflicting. Everything looks good. This is what the kernel actually looks like as of April 7th. You can see right here the yellow being the actual tags, the green over here being branch names, and the commits working upwards. So, this, of course, being upstream 2632.11, latest 2632 kernel. This is actually what Charlie Cloud's kernel looks like right now. I merged in 2632.11, made a couple commits, a new tag, and now my master branch is up here, and they're at the very top of my staging node. The point that my working copy looked like when I screenshot was, I had two commits past my last tag. This was when I actually released the kernel. I got a staging area, so I'm kind of a little bit in between of the middle of a commit, but I can see that all the way here in the screenshot here. Furthermore, of course, the names are all kept into account, so Greg Carr Hartman, who originally released it, released it, and then me after. If I scroll down, let's say I'm interested in something a little bit older, Linux 2631, released on September 9th, and then I took that, I started making a couple other changes, but you can see here how the flow of information works inside of the Linux kernel. Pretty extreme example, but it's really quite cool how this stuff actually flows in here. All commits, since the kernel implemented Git since like 2000 and 
six are in the repository. So you can go back as far as 2616, I think it is, and review what the code looked like there. Now, if you look closely on this, there's something uh, a little weird. Here's all my work, all the actual Ubuntu work, and then it looks like there's another branch coming out of here entirely not connected to anything. This is Ubuntu's branch of what their interpretation of the kernel looks like. When I created my version of repository, I grabbed both kernel.org and Ubuntu's, and I can actually correlate that information all within this window. If Ubuntu releases a patch that fixes the sound card on the GMA500 Realtek device, I could just as well find the commit, cherry pick it, and it shows up on my master branch right there. Eventually, once that Ubuntu specific fix shows up inside of kernel.org, it gets merged down to my side, I'm already aware of it, everything's good. How exactly can this all be laid out? I mentioned earlier there are several different types of workflows. This is blatantly stolen from a website, why Git is better than X. <laughs> they make a lot of good points, and I really didn't feel like re-implementing the wheel, so I literally took some of their graphics and put them inside of OpenOffice here. Their shared access workflow, very close to Subversion style. We've got one shared repository, and the developers all communicate it to it equally, exactly like Subversion. Integrator workflow happens in multiple steps here. We start with a blessed repository. The developers clone it onto their own workstations. They push it up onto a server version of their repositories, and then it gets downloaded to an integration manager and pushed back up. The advantage of this method is that the integration manager serves the role of being like a gatekeeper. Only changes that they approve related to the project actually show up inside of the repository. This is a good actual approach for businesses to say that the integration manager could be the product manager. Really, the product manager needs to approve everything going in. If they're not happy with one of the developers, changes, they could just well revert it. The third model here is the dictator workflow. And this, of course, is what the kernel itself actually follows. So we've got the one central bus repository, pushes down to the developers. Developers push their code to, in essence, lieutenants, which are sort of like the integration manager, for lack of a better way of describing it. But they're more so specific on, on individual areas of the code. For example, we're going to have a lieutenant that manages SCSI code, a lieutenant that manages ALSA, another lieutenant that manages USB. Once they approve the code, they push it up to the dictator, Linus Torvalds. He approves it, tags it as 2632.12, and pushes it to the bus repository. Now, of course, this is the model that the kernel actually followed prior to ever implementing Git. But this is the template that they used when originally producing it, and this is what they follow today. How does the distributed source code management tool work? You've got a first generation node right there. In other words, the first person to release a program. Second generation, several other different people clone that repository. They might make their own changes, but in essence, the repository as it on one now exists on two, so forth down to three, and likewise down to four. So in other words, all of these different um, people have the exact same repository as it existed from their parent node. Let's say our number four guy over here implements a patch. Say he finds a bug in the code, right? Where does it go from here? Four could send it right up to three, or he could actually send it right up to two and one. Eventually, it'll flow all the way back to its original source. It's for his decision to send it to two. It doesn't have to. It's all dependent upon what is convenient at the time. He doesn't want to bother three. Just push it up right now. Now, since two has a repository, it gets sent back upstream. Everyone below that point technically has that change, except for everyone else not directly related to where it started. Likewise, on the opposite end, let's say the three implements a blue change. They push it up. Gets sent over to one. It's up to the top level node generation project owner to decide what I'm actually going to implement. So in essence, they would merge those two changes and produce it as a new release, which then gets pushed back out. Git's true advantage here is that it sort of allows islands of developers here to work in tandem. Four on the end has no idea that three even exists on the far end. They can all coordinate through a central host. They can all coordinate through uh, an established structure, but there's no central host, so to speak. If one decided to drop support for the project, someone else could just take hold and everything just adjusts. How do you actually do it? What are the actual commands? Before you even start doing any source code management, you need to have a working copy of something. Throw git onto this, you want to run git init. That sort of establishes the baseline structure of your working copy. Once you actually make any changes, you can verify them through git status and git diff. So in essence, show you what are the changes based upon where you last checked out. Diff, of course, will be just like the output of a, really, a diff, a patch, really. You want to add them to the actual staging area. So you run git add on a file. So if I modify configure.ac, run git add configure.ac, it puts it inside of the staging area. And then I can run git commit to actually upload it, prompts me for a log message, and I can actually assign that change to a message with my name, and it's in my local repository. Now, the staging area, it's great if you've got a whole bunch of commits. It gets a little cumbersome if you're just doing little one-off things, so it's possible to actually bypass it entirely by literally just using git commit file name. 
really this is the exact same syntax as subversion, commit local changes. In terms of actual network connectivity, once you have your local changes, you do need to actually send them somewhere in order to communicate them to the world. There's two ways in order to set up your repository. If it's brand new, run git commit. If you've got it already hosted on a service, git clone URL. Clones the actual repository to your local copy. And likewise, you can actually configure that repository through a series of git remote commands. When you run git clone URL, you get your local changes are complete, run git push to actually send them up, go back to editing code. So circle, 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 circle. Likewise, if anyone has made any other upstream changes, just run git pull. Get pull after cloning it, get lo update the local working copy, change, 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 et cetera. So nice workflow here. Really, the remote connectivity, this is the only time you actually need internet access. Everything outside of here, are completely offline. Branching, of course, as I mentioned earlier. Let's say we need a topic branch, or we want to change what we're currently working on. Get branch name creates it off the bat. That allows us to apply local changes, and then actually compare what does our branch actually look like compared to where my branch was started. So git diff, git log, whole bunch of neat commands. I can then merge it into another working copy. And again, they're all completely automated. No need to worry about specific revision numbers. No need to worry about any of that fun stuff. Just run git branch, commit, merge. Branch, commit, merge, if that's how you feel. Now, there is one other remote command, git fetch. Fetch, in essence, is just like pull, in the sense that fetch will grab the remote branch from any service, but it won't actually merge it in. This is uh, a good command to run, say, in the case that you are not interested in what is on a remote repository, uh, have it affect your working copy until you're completely happy with it. So if you run git fetch to download the changes, you still need to run git merge to actually bring them into your local copy. So you can, in essence, differentiate between what is upstream and what I'm working on, whereas git pull will just simply download and merge. So, manipulate branches. How do you actually review what's on there? Well, as I mentioned, graphically browse through the git k command. You could do this at any time. It allows you to see exactly the state that you're at, the state where you are. It allows you to actually cherry pick and review individual commits, revert commits, whatnot, etc. Likewise, git k, of course, being the graphical version, you could still run git log, git blame, and git diff. Actually, git blame is really cool if you're not familiar with subversion or not. Git blame will allow you to summarize on a line-by-line -line basis for each file of who actually made that commit and when they actually made it. So if you isolated a bug to being this particular chunk of code in this particular file, you can run git blame on the file and see that this was uh, Aaron Smith a couple months ago who made that commit. Then you can go back saying, what the hell is this shit? You know, so. <laughs> anyway, git blame is great in that regards. Sometimes you just want to download it and get it. You don't need to just do the way the working copy. So just remote git connectivity, clone it, review it. Really, it's all you need to do. You don't need to edit it. Just gives you the opportunity to actually see what the code looks like at any point in time. In a nutshell, this is the entire working flow of using Git. From a basic perspective, there are additional commands there on top of that, but really this is the only thing you need to know. And the only time it gets complicated, if, you're, if you are familiar with Subversion CVS, is the staging area. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Very quickly here, some of the more advanced Git functionality available. Git rebase. Let's say, for example, you are interested in modifying some project that exists their source code on Git. You can clone from them, apply your local changes, release it, the git rebase command will allow you to adjust your changes forward in time to uh, superimpose them up, uh, to a more recent release. So, to put it another way, let's say you clone it at version 1.0 of an upstream program and you release it as 1.0.1. Suddenly, you've got 1.1 coming from upstream. Git rebase will allow you to bring your 0.1 patch level up to 1.1 and upgrade, in essence, or port your existing changes to a more recent upstream version. Bisect. Bisect is awesome. In the case of the kernel, bisect allows you to identify two points in the code that, say for example, if you have a problem, you don't know where it started, you don't know where it came from. Bisect allows you to point out two points in the code where you know that the problem existed and you know that the problem doesn't exist. And git bisect will in essence automatically adjust your checkout to somewhere in the middle. And git bisect is expecting you to say, does the problem exist? So you're on configure, make, make, install. Yes, the problem exists. Okay, then let's go down in the history and bisect it again and see, you know, repeat the process. It'll allow you to narrow down exactly on the individual commit that your problem was caused in. Really neat little, little tool, actually. I mentioned earlier about pulling in from multiple sources, and this is, in essence, what I do during my job with the Ubuntu branch. I am interested in what Ubuntu is doing, but in my opinion, Ubuntu is doing some of the wrong things. <laughs> so what I do is I pull from Ubuntu, 
but I only grab in what I'm specifically interested in. Uh, but I also pull from the kernel.org version, but I also pull from Greg Crow Hartman's specific version of the kernel. And I can actually bring all this in and manage them all within Jolly Cloud's working repository of the kernel and selectively choose what, I, in essence, I'm interested in. And likewise, pushing is the exact same thing. If I have multiple people interested in my code, or if I'm following one of the dictator models, I guess, and I have one commit that affects lieutenant number one, another commit affects lieutenant number two, I can selectively push the changes to who I know is interested, let them worry about only stuff that they're managing, but my entire change as a whole still exists in the Git infrastructure. Create your own Git server. I've got this under advanced usage because this is probably one of the weakest areas of Git in general. In order to create a public repository, you're expected to have an Apache server running web dev or whatnot. Not everyone has access to that. It's not super easy for someone new setting up. If you've never even heard of Apache, you don't have web dev, you don't actually have even some place you can actually SSH to. However, though, there is a really neat little tool called GitHub. GitHub simplifies creating your own Git server immensely. GitHub, what it will actually do is any project currently hosted on GitHub, you can actually fork it right inside of the GitHub interface, apply your changes, and it becomes a medium that you can use to push those changes up to the original developer. So they are the server infrastructure, the integrator, well, they follow the integrator model, generally speaking, the integrator, and of course the communication medium that you use to discuss changes. Uh, they build themselves as being a very social site to code in. Very neat little tool, and we're actually in the process of implementing GitHub inside of Jolly Cloud right now. So a lot of our own code that is unique to our project, pushing it to GitHub so that other people can contribute to it. That is uh, what I have to cover. Thank you very much for your time. These, of course, are some uh, interesting links. I do definitely recommend why Git is better than X. It answers most of the questions that you might have right off the bat. Can you speak a little bit on social, how one should run it with GitHub? Create a GitHub account. That way, you know, it's free to set up to start off with. I think that they do charge a, a fee if you actually want to host something on there. So chances are your provider is already in charging on there. Providing fixes for things. In essence, once you actually create the GitHub account and you create a fork of whatever project you're interested in, you just run the, the Git clone URL that GitHub gives you. And this allows you then to download what GitHub sees the source code as being, allows you to follow this infrastructure to apply any changes, and push them back up, pull them back down. So this is your command line interface to the server you're talking to, in this case, GitHub. When you make a local change, you push it up, you press reload on GitHub, you'll see it right there. Now, once you are completed with the feature you're adding on, GitHub provides an infrastructure for you to notify the original source to say that, hey, I've added this feature that does whatever, and then they can then choose to integrate that into their original source code. But would you keep that each feature as an individual fork? It's up to you. Uh, a fork is more so, a, um, you're a unique developer, you're not a part of the original project, you are in essence forking the repository. For each unique feature you add on, that would be a part of a unique branch, if you wanted to keep it separate, or you can all just tie it under your one master branch, because this is unique to you, this is your fork of the project. When you're ready to push it up, the people who run the original site might say, hey, we like your first feature, but we don't like your second one. So in which case, you could theoretically create a branch that has just the first one, keep branch as the second one, say, okay, go pull branch number one, and then they'll bring that into their side. And GitHub, again, provides the uh, communication hub for that information. But from the command line perspective, you don't really, when you're actually editing code, you don't need to worry about GitHub at all. Just clone it from the URL GitHub gives you, and just uh, get push and get pull. And in essence, that's all you need to worry about. Screen for open source projects. Yes, I think you're right too. Like jQuery moved over to it. Did some work outside of Jolly Cloud. The Palm uh, OS, web OS people, <laughs> not related to Palm themselves, are using GitHub for some of their patches. So that's exactly what I did. I forked their patch repository, applied a couple new patches on my own, pushed it up, and it's in the process of approving. So it's, it's a very convenient way of grouping people together once a project already exists on it. If a project doesn't already exist on there, like the kernel itself, it's not a very, it, not much purpose to using it, because the kernel itself already has an existing infrastructure through kernel.org, if that's what you're interested in. How is it different from that, that bizarre? <laughs> I guess it depends on who you actually ask. I'm just curious, because I'm currently using bizarre, because it was the first uh, distributed mm -hmm. provision control, and I'm curious to see if it would be worth switching. My understanding of the Bazaar is it doesn't actually have the staging area feature. So it's like Subversion, but distributed, right? 
I honestly don't have much experience with Bazaar on the branching merging aspect, but from what I've seen on Ubuntu and Launchpad, there the concept does exist. So in other words, if you go to the network manager page on Launchpad, you can download the Bazaar code and the master trunk, right? As far as I'm aware, those are basically the same. With Git, you can create an entire repository and not have to worry about uploading it to any server whatsoever anywhere. Or if you don't have a server, you have some other box in the US, you could just SSH and that becomes your communication medium. My understanding, Bazaar doesn't really have that kind of flexibility to do something as simple as an rsync or an SSH when talking to your server. Uh, there's, an in, there's a unique protocol with Bazaar. And again, I could be wrong on this. It doesn't seem as complete. What I found with Bazaar itself is an individual protocol. Ubuntu has extended upon it to provide their type of unique functionality. Like for example, there's a, there's a command in Bazaar that allows you to link directly with Launchpad. Very convenient, I guess, since Launchpad is already Bazaar-centric, but Bazaar itself doesn't actually have this feature. Now, what's actually kind of funny, if you follow Chrome OS or Chromium, Google has done the exact same thing, but with Git, they've actually created their own front end over top of it, just like Ubuntu's done with Launchpad, uh, called um, repo, I think, simply put. So you can run repo as a front to the different git commands to, in essence, simplify things, because I think the whole concept of the staging area was a little too uh, inefficient, I guess, for them. So they use repo, which is in front of git, to actually do the same thing that Launchpad is using on top of Bazaar. The two of them, you know, Bazaar and git are basically the same, except for that staging area. And once you do get used to it, trust me, it's worth its weight in gold. <laughs> I mean, even being able to edit something edit a commit you made a month ago and keep it at that point in time and still update it. I, you can't, I don't even think you can do that within Bazaar itself or Subversion, CVS, etc. Definitely take a look at that why Git is better than X because they do use Bazaar as a use case on there. Is it pretty efficient in managing the size, you know, like in terms of your merges and, and all that? Let me actually show you Jolly Cloud's Git repository really quick. We've customized about 200 different packages from Ubuntu and made them more netbook friendly because that's our mandate of course we want to produce an OS that will work on almost all netbooks you can, you have I mean even today if you have a pulsable device you could even take Ubuntu to that whereas in Jolly Cloud you can and we've used Git to modify all these individual packages to apply our mandate to our distribution here you can actually see over here all the different Git repositories that we've currently implemented and some of them should actually look fairly familiar you know GNOME, Glib, GCC defaults, GNOME Power Manager etc and from an individual project perspective. An individual project should be an individual repository. Google's done something really different here, which I don't particularly agree with, but it worked well for them. One of Git's advanced features is a sub-module. And in essence, it allows you to create a meta distribution and create subdirectories linking to other distributions. So when you download the meta distribution, it grabs everything else in between there. I think it's very similar to Subversion's uh, link, I guess it is, or export. Subversion has a similar functionality too, I forget what it's called. When you get that one meta package, if you're interested in all of Chrome OS, it'll automatically download all the other repositories for all the other packages on their own. You can configure Git in such a way that you've got one meta repository that has everything, and also for your developers who are just interested in one individual component, they can find the autoconf.git and bring in just that one repository. Make a change, push it up, and the next person that downloads the meta package will see the change in the autoconf directory. Well, thank you very much, guys, for staying late.